Alfs. Uh, it's a great pleasure to talk with you tonight. Uh, I'm going to be talking about my book, Edible and Medicinal Wild Plants of the Midwest. And this is the third edition now published by Minnesota Historical Society Press. And um, you'll be seeing information about the book and actually uh, stills from the book as we go along. They did such a beautiful job and I wanna start by thanking all the good folks there um, who, who did such a magnificent job on the book. You know, uh, when you see the size of the book, actually I can hold it up for you here. You see, this is a huge book, you know, and, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages. It's, it's almost four pounds. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people say, well, what inspired you to write a book that big about a subject that basically is about weeds? You know, all of these wild plants around us, the, the vast majority of them that are edible and medicinal are actually weeds. Why would you write a book about weeds? The book has over a thousand bibliographic references, um, you know, just a lot of time and effort put into this and people why would you write a book about weeds? Well, that's what I'm going to explain to you tonight. And it all goes back to when I was a little boy back in the 1960s. And uh, I was raised on a farm. And we had meadows and fields and woods and everything all around us. And the great thing about it was that we were renting there. So I didn't have to do farm chores like most kids on a farm. I had time to go out and explore nature. And ever since I was young, nature has been my great love in life. I've spent a third of my conscious existence in nature, studying it, enjoying it, reveling in it. And, um, you know, all these fields and woods around me, we had, you know, wild plum trees and, um, you know, wild strawberries and wild plum, uh, uh, wild apricots, wild apples, wild grapes, you know, all these different wild foods. And, you know, when I went to school, I tell all the kids there about all these great wild foods I was enjoying, and they didn't know what I was talking about. I went home and asked my dad, I says, Dad, why don't why doesn't everybody else know about these? Why aren't they eating these foods? I mean, they're tremendously delicious, and and you know, why aren't people eating them? So, you know, I wondered about that. And I went to the library and I started looking for books on this subject. I came across uh, the books by Yule Gibbons. Yule Gibbons, we call him the great granddaddy of wild food foragers. There's a picture of actually, this is the book that we appreciate the most about him. It was the last book he wrote. It was actually finished by a friend of his. And, um, you know, the tremendous joy that this man experienced going out in nature and exploring all of these weeds and the, the edible aspects of them, how delicious they were, all the recipes he made. But the amazing thing about his books was he eventually demonstrated that these wild foods were more nutritious than the foods that we raise and we eat. So he would take a wild green and compare it to its closest relative that we would, um, that we would market, that we would uh, eat from our farms. And he would show that the wild greens were much more nutritious you know, which again begs the question, why aren't people eating these things? You know, in other countries, they do. Why in the United States don't we appreciate our wild foods? They're more nutritious, they're free, they're delicious. All right, anybody who's eaten a domestic strawberry and eaten a wild strawberry will tell you that there's no comparison. Here's a picture of the wild strawberry in flower, and you'll see the next uh, photo will show it in fruit. And uh, Isaac Walton, the great uh, philosopher said, doubtless God could have made a better berry, but doubtless also that he never did. And uh, the taste is just unbelievable. So, you know, I started wild food foraging in earnest uh, as a teenager, uh, making many recipes in my home. I remember my mom complaining because some of the <laughs> recipes as I was cooking them didn't smell particularly good, but I told her, he says, they taste good and that's what counts. But anyway, um, I started building a home library um, uh, right shortly before I was married, 1977. And at that time, I came across a book by John Lust. And John Lust was a traditional naturopath. And uh, he put together this book on 500 wild plants. And he talked about the medicinal aspects of them. Well, I hadn't, I hadn't learned that much about that. I, I was not familiar 
with the medicinal aspects of plants, just their edible aspects. So I was just fascinated uh, to get this book and add it to my library. Well, uh, my infant son came along uh, in the late 1970s and um, he one day he developed really, really bad colic. And we were staying with some friends and my poor little guy, he was just screaming his head off, bucking, red faced, just couldn't get to sleep. It was like midnight. We tried everything we could. We brought him down to the washing machine, laid him on top, got that going. You know, sometimes the movement of that can calm the kids down. I was just about to tell my wife, let's just get in the car and, and drive home, you know. And the people we were staying with said, you know, there's an old remedy for this. It's catnip tea. And I thought, this is really cool. I remembered catnip from the farm when I was growing up. But I didn't know anything about the medicinal aspects. And of course, I had John Luss book, but I was just beginning to crack the pages and, and look it over. And so we did that. We put it in one of those little shrimpy baby bottles, put it in his mouth. And within minutes, he stopped screaming and crying and fell asleep and slept throughout the whole night for the first time in his life. And I thought, wow, this is really something else. You know, catnip, right? You know, the, the, the herb that makes the cats go crazy. In people and in animals, I discovered, it has the exact opposite effect. It calms them down, calms the gut down, and helps people go to sleep. In Europe, it's used as a sedative herb uh, for sleep. So that really impressed me. And shortly afterwards, something else really impressed me. I developed a duodenal ulcer, an ulcer in the duodenum. And I went to the doctor and, you know, the doctor gave me tagamet, which was cimetidine, which is the, um, the drug at the time that was utilized. I used that for about a year or so, didn't really do much. Then he switched me over to uh, ranitidine, Zantac. You've heard all the commercials, the late night lawyer commercials on that. And uh, that really did a number on me mentally and emotionally. So he took me off of that real quick, put me back on Tagamet. One day I went into the drugstore and I was going to refill my Tagamet prescription. And I talked to the druggist and the druggist said, uh, Mr. Alves, how long have you been coming in and renewing this prescription? And I said, well, gosh, it's about a year and a half now. And he said, are you any better? I said, frankly, no. And he says, you know, I probably shouldn't tell you this but I've been a pharmacist for 20 years. And in that time, I've never seen any of these so-called ulcer drugs do anything. They haven't cured an ulcer yet that I've seen. And I thought, well, why the heck am I using it then? On the way out of the drugstore, I threw it in the garbage. And uh, I knew a gentleman, a good friend, who had ordered an herbal formula from England that had really helped his ulcer. So I got that information and I ordered that formula and uh, I looked in the back of it when it came and I was really surprised because it had six herbs in it and three of them were growing right in my backyard. Uh, and one of them was wild geranium. Now wild geranium is this plant that comes up in the spring. It's one of the first plants in open woodlands, a beautiful picture of it here. And um, this was in that formula as what we would call an astringent. And astringents pull over good tissue over sore um, damaged tissue. It also had in a purple cone flower, which we know as echinacea, golden seal, another herb called wild indigo or baptisia, uh, and a, a marshmallow and slippery elm. And those are demulsants that soothe over sores. And I used that formula for one month and it knocked my ulcer out, confirmed by um, imaging. And I was so impressed with both of those um, experiences that I'd had. And I thought, you know, at this time I had developed a career as a uh, out of print book dealer. I dealt in uh, gently used and out of print books and I was determined to build up a library. Here I am in my bookstore here, um, look a lot younger back in those days. And uh, I decided to build up a library of books on edible medicinal wild plants. Now, this is something booksellers aren't supposed to do. You aren't supposed to collect books when you're in the business. You're supposed to only sell them, right? But I couldn't help pulling all those books out of my inventory. And after a while, I developed a library of several hundred books on edible and medicinal wild plants. And I wanted to, you know, to pursue this in great detail and share what I learned. So I started doing wild plant walks with interested 
members of the public. And I uh, here's a picture of me uh, leading one of those walks here. And uh, uh, I really had a lot of fun with this. And to this day, this is my favorite thing to do is to be out with the plants, to be out with them alone or to be taking other people out uh, to learn about the plants. So uh, I did this uh, for a while and I thought, you know, I'd really like to get formal education in this, but there weren't any uh, herbal educational schools in my area of the country at the time. So I did a lot of research and I finally found one in Canada and uh, I went through their program, it was a two year program. And then I found a Chinese medicine academy here in the United States because they were starting to pop up. And I went uh, two years uh, to that. And then I started Ayurvedic medicine through a series of workshops. Now in that first uh, college I went to in Canada, I studied my basic sciences, biology, physiology, I studied nutrition, I st studied Western herbalism. And when it came time to do my thesis, I decided to do my thesis on edible and medicinal wild plants of Minnesota. That was my thesis, got an A plus on it. And eventually that thesis turned into a book. And that book was called, as you see, Edible and Medicinal Wild Plants of Minnesota and Wisconsin. And that was published a number of years later in 2001. Um, now, uh, at that particular time, uh, a year before that actually, I was invited with a number of other natural medicine clinicians to start the first um, alternative medicine clinic on a medical campus uh, in the Twin Cities area. And that was called the Natural Care Center at Woodwinds on the Woodwinds campus in Woodbury. And I was one of the founding people there. I set up the incredible herbal and nutritional dispensary we had there and started working with people with um, health issues, doing consultations with them and had the privilege to help many hundreds of people uh, gain their health at that time. Now, when my book came out in 2001, I had the great privilege of uh, being on uh, CARE 11 today on January 25th, 2002, um, talking about the book there. And um, that was a really, really enjoyable time. The people there were so nice. We had a wonderful uh, discussion. I had a lot of the herbs, I brought them out and it introduced a lot of people to the idea, to the fact that we have edible and medicinal plants right outside our door here in Minnesota. Now, at that time, I had the great privilege of meeting William Shatner, right? The great Captain Kirk, and he was in the green room and we had the most wonderful talk on uh, health and everything. He told me, he says, if you wanna, I'll go out and tell him when it's my turn, I endorse all of this stuff. I says, no, that's fine. You just do your own presentation and you know, don't worry about me. And, uh, but afterwards um, we talked a little bit more and I was able to give him a copy of that book. And the reason why I did that was his wife uh, at the time was very interested in herbs, primarily Chinese herbs, but I wanted uh, to give her some information on the value of our Western herbs. So that was uh, a lot of fun. And he's a very nice guy, by the way. Okay, so that brings us to 2002. And at that particular point, I had the great privilege of gaining a registered herbalist status with the American Herbalist Guild. And the American Herbalist Guild is uh, at that time was the only professional body of practicing herbalists in the country. So it's like a, like a governing body or a headquarters, you might say, for uh, practicing herbalists. Now, not all herbalists are practitioners, right? So I'm a clinical herbalist and um, I, I practice as a clinician uh, in started again in um, the late 1990s, 2000 with the Woodwinds dispensary there. Uh, and uh, then, you know, at this particular point, this registered herbalist status was for educational and clinical excellence. And at this particular point, I had been doing so much writing and so much research. I wrote a 1400 page curriculum in herbal medicine nutrition for a school that I founded in 2003, the Midwest School of Herbal Studies. And uh, uh, that is going strong to this day. Uh, we're getting more and more students and uh, graduated many, many uh, people. And uh, it's really been a great experience. Now, at that time, also uh, in 2003, I had another book published called 300 Herbs. And uh, this is my best selling book to this day. And there's a picture of it there. And this is actually a Materia Medica and a Repertory. So what we mean by that is a Materia Medica lists the plants 
in alphabetical order, tells how you would apply them, how they would apply, tells what the dosage would be, um, contraindications when you shouldn't use the plant. And then the repertory in the back is the exact opposite. It's conditions to herbs. So it would have things like cold, cough, et cetera, and then it would reflex back to the herbs in the Materia Medica. And this is the only book that had ever been published up to that time that has both a Materia Medica and a repertory uh, in it. And uh, one of my producers in back will show you where you can obtain that book if you'd like to get it. That is used by uh, four different herbal educational colleges uh, in the United States as a textbook. Okay, so uh, this brings us to 2004. And at that point, oh, it was such a joyous time. I was able to open my own integrative uh, medicine clinic, integrative natural therapies clinic. We had um, seven different uh, natural practitioners in that clinic in 2004. And we were in St. Anthony Village, a great uh, suburb of the Minneapolis St. Anthony Village. I grew up in that area uh, as a kid. And uh, uh, that, I, I believe, uh, showing you the uh, website for that, MidwestHerbsAndHealing.com. So uh, this brings us to 2013 then. And in 2013, I uh, released a revised edition of Edible and Medicinal Wild Plants of Minnesota and Wisconsin. We changed the title to Edible and Medicinal Wild Plants of the Midwest. And we did that because you know, not only to reach a, a greater market, but because many of these 100 plants discussed in there and discussed in the current edition we're uh, talking about here tonight, um, grow throughout the five state area. And so uh, that's why we changed uh, the title to that. So that brings us to today. Uh, now, Minnesota Historical Society Press has put out the 2023rd edition of edible and medicinal wild plants of the Midwest. And I'm so excited to talk to you about this because this has so much new material in it from uh, the earlier editions. And a lot of that new material is not only how I've used these plants in my clinical practice, because there's a separate section on that for each plant discussed, how I use them in my practice, but also we've incorporated many, many scientific studies that have been done on these plants since that time. You see, a lot of people don't realize that herbal medicine is the second most scientifically tested form of medicine in the world, right next to pharmaceuticals. Um, and the interesting thing about that is that a number of years ago, a um, college did a study and they compared the studies on medicinal herbs to the studies in pharmaceuticals. They wanted to look at the quality of the studies. Now in America, if you ask your doctor here, well, what about medicinal herbs? You know, is there good evidence for them? The doctor will say, oh no, no, there's no evidence for them, see, because they're not acquainted with this research. The research they get is largely coming from the drug companies, right? But these studies have been done and there have been so many of them done since this time. But anyway, in this comparison between the drugs and the herbs, it's very interesting. They found that the studies on the herbs were more rigorously controlled than the studies on the drugs. Secondly, they were found more likely to have a positive outcome. And thirdly, they were found to have a much greater safety profile, much, much less um, side effects uh, than the drugs had. So we have incorporated so many more, hundreds more studies. And, uh, and this is a uh, shout out to my wonderful editor, uh, Shannon Fairweather here from uh, the press who works so tirelessly with me. We burn the midnight oil, putting all those references in and proofing every aspect of them. And thank you so much, Shannon. And I really appreciate all the hard work you put into that. Uh, you really deserve a nod in that regard. But uh, they have been greatly uh, enlarged, uh, you know, and of course the material in the text as well. So you might wonder, what's this book about? What are some features of the book? Well, uh, my producers here will show you that the book starts off with introductions. And I tell my story here, uh, what we talked about, um, you know, uh, in this section. And we talk about, you know, how we forge, where we forge, you know, where to look. Where do you look for these plants, you know? And we, I give you ideas on where to look. What, what do you need with you? What do you need to take with you to forge particular plants? You see, that is all covered there. And then in the next section, we talk about the chemical constituents of the plants. 
why do these plants work chemically? And here we talk about alkaloids and glycosides and all of these constituents that allow these plants to have such profound effects uh, on the body. The next section, of course, is the longest section. And this is where we analyze 100 plants one at a time. And you can see here is uh, the table of contents for all the 100 plants that we discussed. Now, a lot of these plants from, uh, we'll look at it from just from the herbal standpoint, the medicinal standpoint, a lot of these plants aren't on the market. But as you go through the monographs, and we'll be going through a couple of them tonight, um, my book covers very uh, greatly the Native American uses of these plants. So many of the Native American plants, you see, have not um, been appreciated in this country. You know, the appreciation is for pharmaceuticals, you see. And so um, they have not been explored very much, but um, that's one thing I really wanted to do uh, in these monographs was explore these, all right? And then uh, finally, we have um, a, a appendices on how to make herbal preparations. We tell you how to make tinctures and uh, infusions and decoctions and all that good stuff. And then uh, we have a very detailed glossary. You come across these difficult terms in the book and this goes for page after page, defines those. And then finally, the 1,000 plus references to ethnobotanical and scientific studies. And this goes on and on and on, page after page after page, complete documentation for all the points you know, made uh, in the, the heart of the book in the monographs. And then finally, a very detailed index and the indexer, a nod certainly to her as well for the fine job she did uh, with that index. Okay, so that's an overview of the book. Now let's look at something in detail here. Let's look at two particular plants that I talk about in the book. And we're gonna talk about the edible and medicinal aspects. The first one is stinging nettle. Now, a lot of you may know this plant, there's a picture of it here. This is the plant that if you rub against it with your skin, um, you can get stung. And you can see the close-up, see the stinging hairs right there? I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but if you look on the leaf stalks there, you can see the stinging hairs on the plant. Uh, they call it the seven minute sting because the sting lasts for about seven minutes. I'll give you a little tip right now. If you do get stung by nettle and you can use another leaf or some gloves or even part of your clothes to break the stem itself, the juice inside rubbed on the sting will stop it almost instantly. So the nettle cures its own sting, which is just a fascinating experience. And actually one of the pictures in the book was I had to lie down on my stomach and I rested my elbows on the ground. This was in the spring and underneath the leaves were some newly forming nettles. I didn't know it was there and all over my forearms stung like crazy and just knew about that old uh, remedy. So I broke open the stem, rubbed it on it, instantly stopped uh, the sting. Now stinging nettle is, and I often tell this to my students in my school, this is the greatest nutritional green on the face of the earth absolutely the greatest. You can cook it up for five to 10 minutes. You just simmer it in enough water to cover it. You put a top on the kettle and you have the most delicious greens you'll ever taste. If you like spinach, you'll love stinging nettle. You put a dollop of organic butter on that and you, you would think you've died and gone to heaven, right? But here's the thing, it not only tastes delicious, it is full of such nutrition that as I bring out in the book, in the Nazi extermination camps uh, during World War II, 1930s and 40s, they had a woman's camp called the Ravensbrück camp, and that had several subcamps. And the women in those camps, when they went on work details, gathered stinging nettles, put them in their pockets. When they got back, they prepared them and they ate them. And that gave them the strength to go through that horrible trial that they went through because all they got was bread and water otherwise. You see, you can't live off of that. So they had this nutritious stinging nettle uh, to get them through. Now, Ewell Gibbons demonstrated the nutritional aspect of a stinging nettle. It has more protein than any green that, on the face of the earth. Um, rich array of vitamins and minerals. One study even found vitamin D in stinging nettle, which is just weird as all can be because it's mainly in mushrooms and plants. Um, huge amount of magnesium, huge amount of iron and silica, all sorts of interesting uh, minerals in there. Now, the medicinal aspect of nettles, right? The leaves are Western herbalism's greatest anti-allergic. 
So nettle leaf tea, which by the way, tastes delicious, uh, is an old remedy for hay fever. And uh, it is just a tremendous herb for that. Also the leaves build up the blood. So people with anemia and things like that can really benefit from using nettle leaves as a capsule or as a tea. Now, uh, another aspect of nettle is actually the flowers. I don't know if you're able to go back and show the first picture of nettle there with the flowers. Oh, there we go. Okay, so if you look at the flowers there uh, in uh, the late summer, early fall, little seeds develop inside there. And those seeds are one of the greatest um, medicinals for the kidneys. And what they do is they can actually restore lost kidney function. So we do a lab called creatinine to measure kidney health. And if the level goes above 1.2, for each tenth of a point it goes above means the destruction of thousands of kidney cells, right? So I have been able to use nettle seed to help people that had a creatinine level over three, and we are able to bring it back to 1.7, all right? And that is basically impossible according to nephrologists, all right? The interesting thing about that is the gentleman that I was that I had, was working with to do that with, as I was writing the section of that in the 2013 edition where we put that information in on, as I was writing about the power of nettle seed, and I gave the experience of this gentleman who we knocked down from above three to 1.7, at that very moment I was writing it, he called to get a refill. Talk about serendipity, right? Talk about, you know, synchronicity. Carl Jung, I mean, really, really interesting. The other thing about nettle is the root is one of the greatest medicines for prostate, in large prostate, even prostate cancer. And in Germany, medical doctors who, are, who have to study herbal medicine as their curriculum, this is the first prescription for enlarged prostate, way before the drugs, because it's very, very safe. And some of the drugs can actually have sexual side effects and in some cases, they are permanent, permanent sexual side effects. So stinging nettle root not only helps the problem, but it actually increases libido through a very complicated chemical pathway I won't get into tonight. All right, if we have time here, and I, I don't have a cue on the time, I'd like to talk about thistle. Um, can you let me know if we have time for that? Okay, okay, there we go. So I'm assuming we can talk about that. So. So thistles, you know, we have quite a few thistles here. This is the Curcium genus, and all of the thistles have edible roots. You have to peel the core of them, but they are a survival food. Um, and if you if you can, you can cook them in uh, several waters on the stove, and uh, they're pretty good, you know, if, if you can cook them properly. And I tell you how to do that here in the book. Um, the other thing is is that a lot of the leaf stalks are also edible if you peel them. And uh, so we're talking about right here, see, well, that's a flower stalk, but uh, a little below here, we'd have one of the leaf stalks. And uh, they taste like celery. Uh, they're pretty good too. Now the flowers, this is the Canada thistle. The flowers of Canada thistle are also edible and they taste like bubble gum. You chew these up and the juice tastes just like bubble gum. It's really, really good. The Canada thistle is the only one without the thorns on the bract here that holds the flower. So you can grab that bract and then pull off the flower and chew on it, get that wonderful bubblegum taste, and then you can spit out the flowers if you want them. Now, the bull thistle, uh, we have a picture of that coming up. The bull thistle is a very, very interesting medicinal herb. Actually, that's the one we had previously, if you can go back to that. Uh, the bull thistle has, uh, there we go, has thorns all over the bract here. Uh, and this is the real nasty looking thistle. It has these huge barbs all over it. And everybody would think, well, what is that good for? Well, I have had the great privilege of reintroducing um, our herbal uh, culture to the medicinal benefits of this that were lost pretty much in the 1930s. But what this um, herb can actually do, uh, and I've had over 50 cases in my clinic that I've worked with with this and been successful, is autoimmune joint conditions. Now, when we look at a plant, um, you know, in herbalism, we believe the plant will tell you how it can help you. And if you look at a bull thistle, it's very stiff looking and it has those, those prickles, those thorns on it that you know if that jabbed you, they're gonna hurt, right? So it's telling you that I'm for people who are too stiff and have this jabbing pain, you see, which these people do, these autoimmune joint conditions. 
So people, for example, with psoriatic, with psoriasis, a quarter of them develop psoriatic arthritis. A quarter of people with inflammatory bowel disease develop what's called enteropathic arthritis. These are autoimmune conditions. And um, this particular herb has been shown to be very, very effective in my clinical practice in helping these people uh, to a great degree. Um, now, uh, there is an article, and I believe uh, one of my producers will put this in the chat for you, that I wrote for the Journal of the American Herbalist Guild, where I told about some of my clinical work uh, with uh, bull thistle for these. They're called spondyloarthropathies, these autoimmune joint conditions. So, okay, well, um, I guess at this particular point, we'll see if we have some questions. Uh, I'm thinking I should probably exit my full screen here. Could somebody give me a cue on that? Because I'm not seeing anything here. Okay, yeah, here we got the, some of the questions coming in. Okay, we've got a great question from uh, Dana. Are nettles edible at any stage? Well, uh, unfortunately, the answer to that is, is probably best to say no. And that's because once nettles get above six inches tall, they develop these little tiny, um, I don't know what you'd call them. They're like little tiny uh, grains of, of pebbles in them called systoliths. And those systoliths can irritate the kidneys if you're, if you're eating them on any sort of regular uh, basis. So what we say for the older plants is that you can snip off the newly formed leaves on the top only and use those. The great thing about nettles is they're almost always found in a colony. Might be a loose colony spread apart, but they're almost always in a colony. So even at the later stage, like the photo that we showed you earlier with uh, the flowers on, even at that stage, you can clip off the uh, young, newly formed leaves at the top. They don't have the systolus. But your best bet is to do six inches and under in the spring. Let's see if we have another question. Yes, this is from May. Are there any pet usages in the book? Um, you know, uh, I, not specifically, but many of the uses for people can be used for pets. Now, in this regard, I'm going to refer you to one of my favorite people, I did a, um, an obituary for her, I wrote an article for her, Juliet de Berkeley Levy, L-E-V-Y. And uh, she was an amazing woman. There's a great documentary on her called Juliet of the Herbs, you can get. But she wrote the, the greatest pet herbals that have ever been done, and she wrote several of them. And she raised uh, Afghan hounds and all sorts of interesting animals. She cured uh, pets of some very famous people. And I, I would encourage you to get her books, Juliet de Berkeley Levy, L-E-V-Y. And I think if you just, uh, you know, did a search on that, you'd come up with her books. There's also a, a newer book written. Um, I'm trying to remember the, the name of it now. I have it in my library. Um, and, uh, oh gosh, I think it's just called Veterinary Herbal Medicine. And uh, the author, her first name is Susan. I, I can't remember the rest of it. But anyway, that's a more modern book that would go through the herbs one by one and kind of monograph them and different conditions that are done for that too. So uh, that's another great book too. So yes, some of these are applicable to pets. That's correct. Uh, okay. Um, all right. So uh, identifying plants growing in the regions, fields, meadows, and woods. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the book is, is going to give you all the detailed information on that. Uh, you know, if there's a specific plant that you were wondering about, if that question can still be put up, I, I didn't get a chance to finish it all. Um, sure, detailed list of plants for specific physiological functions. Yeah, um, I, I mean, this is all done in the book. And, and uh, if you'd like to know anything in particular about a particular plant, be happy to talk about that today. I mean, for thistle, for example, Thistles grow in fields and meadows. Bull thistle will grow near water generally. Uh, stinging nettle will grow in the richest soil uh, available. And the reason why that is, you see these weeds, they grow where they want to grow. And why do they grow where they want to grow? Because the minerals that they need, they pull up from that soil. So remember how we mentioned stinging nettle has the richest array of minerals of any plant? That's because it grows in mineral rich soil. So those are our two tips on that I can offer you. And again, if you have any specific questions, please put them in the uh, questions and I'll, I'll deal with those for you. 
Okay, uh, this is from Pacao. How would you extract the flower seeds from the nettles? Um, so, so that part you see does not have any stings on it. So basically, what you would do is you would you winnow and husk them, you know, in your hands. Uh, they're very very small, <laughs> and it's not easy to do. But I will tell you that um, the seed nettle seed is on the market. You can actually buy it. There's a company called Herbalist and Alchemist. Uh, and that company is founded by a, a friend and colleague of mine, David Winston, and they have that available. So they've done all the work for you, nettle seed tincture. Okay, uh, can you talk a bit about scouting for plants and where to look for wild plants? Yeah, what kind of equipment? Okay, again, this is in detail in the book, but um, I will say this is that, you know, a lot of people are concerned about, you know, various places you might go to want to find plants, there's going to be restrictions on, on pulling them, right? Recently, Minneapolis did allow uh, limited foraging in their particular parks, but generally, um, your best bet is what are called wildlife management areas, and you can get a list of them at the DNR. And at wildlife management areas, a number of years ago, um, they stated that um, you are free to pick plants for personal and ornamental uh, usage. So that is one area. Vacant lots or Private land with permission are areas to look at. Now, as far as, as locales, as terrain, right, the best place to find both edible and medicinal plants is where two types of terrain intersect. Okay, a woods intersects a meadow, a pond intersects a field, right? When you have that, those perimeters, you're going to have a rich array of plants from both of the, you know, the geographic areas that are connecting at that perimeter. Okay, let's see if we have some more questions here. Uh, again, this is from Pakal. Will you be doing walking tours again after COVID? Of course, actually, we're still doing them during COVID, keeping physical distancing uh, out in the fields. Of course, they're done right now. They're going to start again in the spring. Now, I also mentioned I teach at Normandale Community College in Bloomington. I started my 19th year there. And every spring and every fall, I do a walk for the public there. Uh, and that is usually on a Wednesday evening, usually starts around supper time. So you can go to normandale.edu and we haven't scheduled the spring walk yet, but that's where you're going to find uh, that information. And oh, we have a great time because that campus has woods and fields. They've got a pond, they've got a marsh, and then they've got around this pond, they have purposely planted medicinal plants. So we spend a lot of time just walking around this pond. They have a nice little stone walkway there. And I just love teaching at Normandale. Good, good folks there. And we have just a great, great time. Now, uh, if you join my school, eventually, um, you'll be able to do, we have five wild plant walks from spring uh, through the fall. And these are all at different areas. And um, at, you know, different times of the year, different plants will be blooming, right? So that's why we do them. We kind of bring you through the seasons uh, with these wild plant walks. Any other questions? What's the best use for Solomon seal? Okay, so Solomon seal I have a great fondness for because this is one of the very first plants I started working with back when I was in edible wild plants only in the 1970s. This was the one I would cook up in the kitchen that my mom would get so upset at me because it would stink up the whole house and it just stinks horrible, but it is really, really delicious. Now, the, the medicinal uses for Solomon seal are legion. There, there's quite a few of them. Uh, but it's especially good for um, what we might call contorted ligaments and tendons in the body. Um, and uh, what I often say is, you know, if you're sitting down and you get up and you hear a snap, crackle, pop, remember the old commercial for Rice Krispies? Uh, I call it Rice Krispies syndrome of the joints, right? You hear snap, crackle, pop. That popping noise uh, is what uh, Solomon seal is tremendous for. And you can do it internally. Uh, in 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 um, judicious amounts, my book 300 Herbs tells you the dosages that should be used for uh, some of these herbs, and and topically, it's just wonderful. You can take the tincture, the alcoholic extract, and rub it in that area of the joints, rub it in the the tendon, the ligament, uh, things like that. It's also used, by the way, for um, hyperglycemia, elevated blood sugar, and it brings down elevated uh, blood sugar. Um, in, in, a, in a very healthy way, okay? So what happens is, you know, 
your sugar is supposed to get out of your blood into your cells, all right? And what does that is insulin. Insulin attaches into your cells, releases glucose transporters to bring the glucose to sugar out of the blood into the cells, and that helps make energy, ATP, right? So that's a very efficient process, except we've messed it up with our modern lifestyle. So many people are running around with what we call insulin resistance, all right? Eventually becomes metabolic syndrome, eventually becomes type 2 diabetes. So Solomon seal has been shown in scientific research and was used in China for hundreds of years before then for diabetes, for metabolic syndrome, for insulin resistance, even you know before it evolves into diabetes. And uh, it does that in that very healthy way of overcoming the insulin resistance, helping the cells to accept the glucose coming in. Now, some drugs and some herbs work in another way. They work by stimulating insulin from the pancreas. And that's not usually a good thing to do with um, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, or even early type 2 diabetes, because the problem is not there. The problem is at the cells. So Solomon Seal is very, very good uh, at doing that. Now, Solomon Seal is somewhat threatened uh, today. And uh, so I, I like to encourage people to get it commercially and to get it from reliable uh, suppliers. And these would be companies that are started by herbalists that have the ethic of preserving and conserving these medicinal plants, right? And also their reputation's at stake. So these products not only have to have in them what they say they do, but they have to get the results that are expected of them. So I would say to get these again from herbalist created and run companies. And I'll leave it to you to find those because I don't like to endorse particular companies. I'm not connected with any of them, but I don't like to denor, uh, endorse any of them. See if we have another question here. Okay, so here's the problem now. <laughs> this is a very good point. Virginia asks, could you discuss gotweed heals all bishop's weed? You see, common names are a real problem because different regions use different common names for a particular uh, plant. And so what's best is um, the Latin name, the scientific name. That way we know exactly what species we're talking about. Now, if you mean heal all or self-heal, um, this is an herb called Prunella vulgaris that grows in our area. It's a little tiny, short little mint that grows near water. Um, and it's one of my favorite herbs because it's antiviral uh, and it's very, very good topically for things like herpes uh, breakouts, uh, both oral and genital herpes. Uh, very, very uh, good for that. Um, the herb itself um, has been shown, um, made as a tea, has been shown by the Chinese to actually um, help inhibit the ability of HIV to knock out T4, CD4 cells. So I give it to people who are newly diagnosed with HIV and they drink the tea three cups a day, and the Chinese research shows that it's effective in uh, keeping the integrity, the strength of their T4 cells, which are we call T helper cells, a very important part of the immune system. All right, let's see if we have any more questions here. Uh, do you know if insurance companies will support herbal medicine? Yeah, we get asked that a lot, and I will tell you right now, this will be the last therapy they will ever support. Now, Think about why that would be, all right? So you know that our, our medical model in the United States and many countries is based on pharmaceuticals, right? Pharmaceuticals you can patent and protect your financial interest in, and these drug companies are very interested in financial gain, right? And so anything that threatens that financial gain, anything that threatens their fat salaries is going to be anathema to them. And when you think about all the natural therapies that are out there, acupuncture, chiropractic, massage therapy, um, you know, shiatsu, all of these different ones, none of them are direct competition to the pharmaceutical companies. The only one that is, is herbal medicine, right? All right to some extent, homeopathy, homeopathic medicine. That's different from herbal medicine. Sometimes people confuse that. But those are the only two that are really a threat to them. So you see the insurance companies are bedfellows with the drug companies, all right? Uh, they are very much uh, in harmony with one another. And so the drug companies will never allow the insurance companies to cover herbal medicine. 
That's my that's my opinion. I mean, that's not, I'm not stating that as fact. That's my opinion. All right, let's see if we have some more here. Uh, Brianna asks, what would be your recommendation for someone wanting to pursue a master herbal program? Uh, my school or the local community college, I presume, I mean Normandale there. What are the benefits of each program? Okay, so my, my program at Normandale, it's an eight class session that we do in the spring and the fall. And it's basically an introduction to herbal medicine, right? Typically a, a third of those people actually wind up joining my school which is much more intensive program. Now we've got several programs, but our major one, that master herbalist program you asked about, typically takes two to three years to, uh, to finish. And instead of 20 some hours uh, that the Normandale program is, we're, we're getting closer to 2000 hours of study for that. So, but a lot of people, they, they kind of want to get their feet wet. What is this all about, you know? And a lot of people take the Normandale classes and they just love it. They, they cannot talk enough about it. They get extensive notes and handouts. They share it with their friends and relatives. And then they want to learn more. You know, they want to learn more. So then they often go on uh, to join my school. But my Master Herbalist Diploma program is one of the very few programs in the country that is still a printed program. And this is a shout out now to books. You see behind me, right? 4,000 volume home library. Why do we still have the program in printed form? Study was done in Norway, Stavanger University, comparing retention between reading printed materials versus reading an ebook or, you know, off of a, um, like a Nook or a Kindle or something like that, right? And the people that read the physical book had much greater retention. Now, what I tell inquirers of my school is that by the time you have finished our program, you will be a world-class herbalist and you will not be a world-class herbalist if you do your studies in a um, ebook or a, a reader according to the research in Stavanger University. What's really interesting about that study that they did was they're trying to figure out why. Why is retention so much better from a printed book as opposed to an ebook? And you know what the conclusion was? The conclusion was that the, the act of turning the page somehow cemented that material you had just read into your brain. And that makes a lot of sense to me. And you know, the other thing that our students really appreciate about the printed program is they can get their highlighter out. You know, they can make notes, they can put asterisks in the margin. And you know, how much fun is that? On a nice day, you take it out on a lawn chair outside, right? You sit out there, you enjoy it, you know. Uh, get a hot cup of cocoa on a day like today, sit on your, on your easy chair in your room, and uh, they just enjoy the heck out of it. All right, let's see what else we have. Uh, okay, this is Sam again. Uh, I have another, which na native Midwestern species has the most noticeable psychoactive spiritual properties? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, I can think of some outside of our region. You know, you go out to peyote, of course, out in the Western United States. You have the Ayurvedic tradition, uh, holy basil or Tulsi, which is thought to have the most prana or spirit in it. I often tell my students, um, it puts you in a very spiritual frame of mind because of that. And interestingly, physiologically, what's happening is it lowers your levels of cortisol, the stress hormone, the fight or flight the lengthy fight or flight hormone, right? It lowers that. When you're fighting or fleeing, you can't be spiritual. You can't be feeling groovy, like we used to say in the 60s and 70s. Holy basil makes you feel groovy, right? Uh, and it's just a wonderful, they have Tulsi tea you can get at the natural grocery stores, the health food stores. Some of them are flavored. We carry them at our clinic, raspberry peach. They got a honey chamomile. Wonderful, wonderful tea to sip on at night to uh, calm you down, relax you, and ease you into a wonderful night's sleep. But you know, if you have some spiritual reading you want to do at that time, uh, I, I feel that it really magnifies that. So if I think of one Midwestern, I'll bring it up, but I, those are the two that I, I think of outside of our region. All right, uh, let's see, Elizabeth, how do you use Solomon Seal to help with insulin resistance? Well, it would be the same way you'd use it otherwise. It's available as a tincture from several companies, and then it's also available as a bulk herb from some of the companies. Uh, now, of course, 
um, you know, the smell is is really bad. I mean, whether, you know, whether it's the tincture or the bulk herd you make into a tea, but the taste is not bad at all. And um, that's what you would do. You would use it just like you would any other herb for insulin resistance. You'd use it several times a day, um, you know, usually between meals or after meals. Um, and, you know, with the tea, the great thing is you can just kind of sip on it throughout the day. Generally, you'd be looking at, you know, two to three cups of the tea or two to three dosages of the tincture. And there's many other herbs for uh, insulin resistance, uh, many, many other herbs. And you can read about those in uh, the book we're talking about tonight. You can also read about them in 300 herbs uh, in the repertory in the back, um, you know, where it lists the health conditions. You would look under things like metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, diabetes, and you'd see all those different herbs. And then you can go back and look at them and look at dosages and things like that. So because Solomon seal is somewhat threatened, you know, um, sometimes it might be more um, ecologic to look at some of these other herbs uh, that are more common uh, that can do that. And again, 300 herbs and edible medicinal wild plants um, in the index would give you some, uh, some of those herbs. Okay, I can't give particular advice to individuals here, okay? So let's just say, let's just talk uh, in general. Uh, this individual wants to know about cholesterol. Uh, are there herbs that can help to manage uh, cholesterol uh, levels? And, you know, this is a, a big, long topic we don't have time to go into tonight. But let me just tell you this. Um, cholesterol is not a bad guy. Cholesterol is a good guy. You'd be dead without cholesterol. Your liver makes it right? And your liver makes it to perform many, many important functions in the body. All your sex hormones are made from cholesterol. Cortisol we talked about is made from cholesterol, right? The problem with cholesterol is if it gets oxidized and it can get oxidized and you can get the small, dense, hard cholesterol particles. And, and what happens is they can wind up placking your arteries and creating problems, all right? So the important thing to do is to help ensure that your cholesterol doesn't oxidize. Now you can actually do an oxidized cholesterol lab test. And one of the things I'll share with you uh, and that we often put on our Facebook page for our clinic is that um, people aren't aware that you can order your own labs, okay? There are consumer direct labs all over the place. In the Twin Cities area, there are ones you can do uh, through, you know, through the uh, internet and you can check for things like, is your cholesterol oxidized, okay? So there's the Life Extension Foundation, lef.org. They offer an oxidized cholesterol test. You order it yourself, a doctor there signs off on it. You can check to see if your cholesterol is oxidized. Even through your regular doctor, you can do a particle size test, all right? Quest offers that on the, the labs that they use. So these things can be done, but the, the typical doctor is not going to do them because these drug companies are so powerful and they, they issue this propaganda to them that you have to have low cholesterol levels. So did you know that low cholesterol levels are much more harmful than high cholesterol levels, right? And the reason why is your brain, your glial cells in your brain need cholesterol to work. You can't think without cholesterol. You can't remember without cholesterol. If your cholesterol goes too low, We've got several studies in the scientific literature. If your total cholesterol goes below 160 and stays there, your suicide risk doubles, right? You can, you can develop something called transient global amnesia where you can't remember anything past a certain age if your cholesterol goes too low. So these statin drugs, I could preach against them for hours after hours. They're the most dangerous things, the most dangerous drugs on the market today. There's a a study in the literature called statins cause congestive heart failure, right? There's another recent study showing they cause hemorrhagic stroke, right? So these are very dangerous drugs and we want to get away from this idea of lowering cholesterol. We want to make sure that cholesterol doesn't get oxidized. And we do that by having antioxidants in our diet and the book we're talking about tonight, all these wild foods are rich in antioxidants. So if you become a wild foods forager, and enjoy all these wild berries, especially the wild berries, right? They are so rich in antioxidants. And if you keep your good cholesterol up, your HDL, that removes the cholesterol from the system and gets rid of it eventually. And that HDL is supported by nuts. Nuts is the greatest thing in exercise and olive oil bring up your HDL. 
So those are my thoughts on that. Again, it's an hour long subject. <laughs> we don't have time for it tonight, but I hope that was helpful for you. All right, I know we're getting close to the end here. What's the difference between herbal and homeopathic? Oh boy, that's uh, we had to save that, that toughie for, for the end here. So homeopathy was started in the 1800s by a guy named Samuel Hahnemann. And it's primarily popular in English speaking lands. And what it does is it uses not only plants, but also other substances in very, very dilute form with the idea that it would have um, an effect, um, how do I put this? That's actually different from the original substance. Okay, let me give you an example. If you peel an onion, right? What happens to your eyes and your nose? Sometimes you get watery eyes, right? Itchy, almost like it's an allergy, right? So you get this thin, clear mucus coming down. So in homeopathy, they take onion, dilute it to a great degree, and has the opposite effect. It actually dries up and stops these, these thin, acrid secretions that come down. So again, um, started, started in the 1800s, uh, not widespread. Herbal medicine is the oldest form of therapy in the face of the earth. Neanderthals used it, right? We, we, got, we got research showing Neanderthals used herbal medicine, right? Way back 1500, 1600 BCE, Egyptians, everybody else. Every country has an indigenous plant medicine. That's herbal medicine. Second most studied form of medicine on the planet. Homeopathy has good research on it, but nowhere near the research that herbal medicine has. And homeopathy, by the way, if you're wondering what that is, it comes in these little vials, right? Little tiny round little pellets. You turn the cap and then they come out in the cap and you put them in your mouth. That's homeopathic medicines. So if you go to a place like Whole Foods, you'll see a little rack of those, right? But herbal medicines are gonna come in bottles. They'll be in capsules, they'll be in teas, or they'll be in little tincture bottles, little bottles with a dropper on it. That's the difference. Okay, um, are you still offering? Yeah, so this is, oh, I'm so glad you brought this up. I forgot to mention this. We have a COVID buster special now for our Master Herbalist program. It ends tomorrow at midnight. Um, we really won't be taking it off until the next day around noon. And I am gonna talk to our marketing person. I forgot that we had that on here and it's gonna end tomorrow. I'm gonna talk to our marketing person to see if we can extend that through Monday. But yeah, we've actually got 55% off on our Master Herbalist Diploma program now. And uh, I'm gonna see if we can extend it through Monday, but it, for sure it's good through midnight uh, tomorrow. Um, and we, we do that very, very seldom, but because you've noticed everything is on sale right now, right? Uh, so we call it our COVID buster sale. Okay, uh, many, many years ago. Oh yeah, okay, great. I remember you, Aaron. Uh, yeah, we have them on CD, right? It's a great question. She says, the lectures I have from the school when I joined it many years ago were on audio cassette, do you have them on CD? So here's what happened is we put them on CD for a while, but then, you know, a lot of people, you know, didn't have CD players anymore. So we don't have any audio lectures now. What we do is we have our lesson questions on CD. We also have the lesson questions on our website um, for those who don't have a CD player anymore. And then uh, the lesson questions are also in the workbooks as well. So they're in three different areas, but no, we no longer have the audio portions of the program available. Last question coming up. Any recommendations? Okay, for vitiligo or vitiligo. So this particular condition um, is a condition where the skin loses its pigmentation. And um, so in, in my book, uh, Lamb's Quarters uh, has traditionally been used for this um, I find it, you know, irregular. I don't find that it necessarily works that well for it. But what this condition is, it's a problem with the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands are not secreting the hormones in the correct amount that they should. So I always have my clients with this condition do an uh, adrenal stress index through one of the consumer direct labs. We see what's going on with the adrenal secretions, and then we support them with the appropriate herbs and nutrients. But I will tell you this very quickly. The adrenals need certain vitamins, and the most important vitamins are vitamin B5, also called panathenic acid, and vitamin C. I've had a number of cases of this where that's all we've needed uh, to help those individuals. And again, obviously, the earliest you can get at something like that, uh, the better. But uh, I always say check the adrenals, see what's going on there, and then uh, the appropriate nutrition and herbs uh, can be utilized. And 300 Herbs also has an entry in the back for that 
we'll talk about that as well. Okay, well, I think that's the last question for tonight. So I want to thank you so much for your time and attention tonight. Um, and I really, really appreciated all the great questions that we've had. So thank you again, and I hope you enjoy my book. Um, in my library, I have 4,000 books. This is the most beautiful book I have in my library. I can't tell you the gratitude I have towards Minnesota Historical Society Press for this. Uh, so if, if you can get this book, I think you'll really, really appreciate it and utilize it. So thank you again for your attention. Hope everybody has a great evening. Bye-bye now.